We have some new and exclusive information in this video that we wanted to start off with. We recently translated an interview from the 124th issue of the Japanese magazine Nintendo Dream. This issue featured an interview about The Legend of Zelda The Minish Cap between Eiji Aonuma, who acted as the game's supervisor, and Hidemaro Fujibayashi, who directed the game over at Capcom, and who would ultimately join Nintendo to work on future Zelda games. The interview has some interesting facts that have never been posted anywhere else, including how the character Ezlo was basically made to avoid past mistakes. When Capcom were working on the Oracle of Ages and Seasons, they lacked a character that could explain things to the player, which put them at a disadvantage. Fujibayashi elaborated, At the time that we were making the Oracle games, we really struggled with the lack of a character like Na'vi in Ocarina of Time that could explain the situation. So from the beginning, we had decided there would be a companion character on the next adventure. Although Ezlo was added to conform to what worked in past Zeldas, Ezlo's design challenged some series conventions. It's pointed out in the interview that the green-pointed hat is an iconic feature of Link, and trying to alter that might have been met with resistance by Nintendo. However, that wasn't the case. Alnuma explained, Since Ezlo's mouth only appears when the hat is talking, they said it was no problem. The interview also brings up how Zelda games like Majora's Mask and Wind Waker seem to have moved away from having large amounts of dungeons to explore in favor of a more detailed overworld. And something that adds depth outside of the dungeons in Minish Cap is the Kinstone system. Aonuma was so impressed with how Kinstones motivated players to fully explore new areas that he proclaimed, I think this new system will be a cornerstone of upcoming Zelda games. Despite his enthusiasm, the Kinstone system has yet to return to Zelda. Minish Cap's Hyrule Town is a fairly dense and bustling area in the center of the game's world, which led to the interviewer asking if Hyrule Town was inspired by Majora's Mask Clock Town. But Aonuma shot that down by saying, no, it's its own thing. But immediately after, Fujibayashi follows up by saying, we had talked about making a game that stays just in town for a while. Interestingly, Fujibayashi said earlier in the interview that they originally wanted Link to wear all kinds of different masks and hats, but this was reduced in scope to Link having a single hat that could talk. So the Minish Cap was originally a game that made players stay in a central town for a while and had tons of different masks to wear. Sounds like in its early stages, Minish Cap was more like a 2D Majora's Mask. We have more exclusive trivia coming up later in the video, so stick around for that. One other big adventure on the Game Boy Advance featured Nintendo's main man, Mario, in Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga. The game kicks off with a normally unlosable battle against Bowser, with the key word there being normally. Bowser only causes 1 HP of damage to Mario per turn, and since Mario has 10 HP, and Bowser will tap out after 5 turns, there's normally no way for Mario to lose all of his health. But if the game is hacked to reduce Mario's HP to 5 or lower at the battle's start, the player will be able to lose. And as it turns out, losing doesn't take the player to the game over screen, so they'll just be softlocked in this battle until they reset their GBA. This would change in the very next Mario RPG, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, which will at least give the player a game over screen should they fail in their unlosable battle against Lord Crump. Although this soft lock in Mario & Luigi is one that you can only achieve via hacking, some other locks in the game are remarkably easy to trigger. For example, players can perform a high jump on top of Mini Mario while having Mario hit Luigi mid-jump, which normally gives the player a coin. However, if this is done in the fourth boss room in Bowser's castle, it will instantly eradicate the brothers instead, and force the player to reset their game. A similar lock can occur when standing next to an NPC on a ledge. If small Mario and the high jump skill are selected, then the player presses B, A, and then right, Mario will fall off the ledge, with an agonized looking Luigi left above, unable to move. Once again, the only solution to this is for the player to reset their game. Some soft locks can even occur without any input from the player themselves. If the player performs a set of bros attacks correctly, Mario will get an idea to do an advanced bros attack, illustrated with a little thinking animation. If this occurs in the battle against the Huhuros boss, while the boss is also using the thinking animation, the game will get stuck in a state where it doesn't consider it to be anybody's turn. So Mario, Luigi, and Huhuros will continue to just stare at one another in perpetuity. 
As we've mentioned previously on the show, Nintendo did once own the Banjo IP, but it left along with Rare with Microsoft's acquisition of the company. And Nintendo planned on publishing Grunty's Revenge prior to the acquisition. A small relic of this can be seen in the game's data, an unused Nintendo logo that would have appeared in the game's introduction. But the game has some unseen properties that are far more impressive. The game is quite a unique creation for the handheld, as while it may be a top-down 2D platformer, the areas in which the player walks were created with full 3D collision crafted out of blocks and wedges to carefully and accurately allow for 3D platforming on the handheld. This no doubt helped the games feel a little bit more like their N64 predecessors than it would have without. During gameplay, this 3D element to the game can easily be missed, as it is never directly presented to the player. Another piece of a game that's easy to miss is a certain bit of AI behavior for the units in Advance Wars 2 Black Hole Rising. Every unit that the enemy builds during combat is assigned one of seven different AI types, with each individual unit being differently weighted to have a particular behavior assigned to it, and each pre-deployed unit spawned at the mission's start has a pre-assigned type already. AI Type 1's goal is to target the enemy HQ, 2's goal is to escort infantry and land units, 3's goal is to capture properties, 4's goal is to act aggressively, 5's goal is to act defensively, and 7's goal is to protect the enemy HQ. These are all implemented and functional in-game. You might be wondering why we didn't mention AI Type 6. Well, AI Type 6 has a 0% chance of being assigned to any unit, and in fact, is only assigned to two medium tanks in the entire game. They can be seen here in the level Drake's Dilemma, and they never interact with the player at all due to them being too far away. Although these tanks spend the entire mission dancing around in circles doing nothing, AI Type 6 is actually noticeably tougher than the average unit. The modder Kartal has done some experiments with AI Type 6, has found that they secure bases by zoning out your infantry from capturing them, and even they know when to stay back and when to cover their own infantry. It's quite remarkable that such a relatively sophisticated AI would go essentially unused for the entire game. Next up, we have a fact about Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire that very few people will have actually witnessed. In Ruby and Sapphire, it is not actually possible for the player to lose the opening battle against the Pugina that's found attacking Professor Birch near the start of the game. The offending Pugina is actually programmed to flee the fight if the player trainer somehow manages to get their Pokemon down to critical health. Speaking of rarely seen scenarios in Pokemon, Pokemon Emerald also has some unique and unintended behavior in its Japanese release. In the Japanese game, players can use Dive on the deep water tiles in Team Aqua's hideout, even though there's nothing to dive down to. This was clearly a programming oversight, as diving in the water simply teleports the player back to Petalburg City, the lowest indexed map location in the game. This error was fixed in the international release by simply disabling dive while on the tiles. This glitch isn't in any version of Ruby and Sapphire because in those games the entrance to the hideout is no longer accessible after obtaining the Mind Badge, which is required to use dive in the overworld. There'll be some more Pokemon facts at the end of this video, exclusive facts in fact, so be sure to stick around for those. In June 2021, it was revealed that one of the best-selling titles on the Nintendo Wii U eShop was Metroid Fusion, surpassed only by Metroid Zero Mission. This surge in sales for two handheld Metroid games was thanks almost entirely to the reveal of Metroid Dread in Nintendo's 2021 E3 Direct. Keep in mind, most people had already moved on from their Wii U's by 2021, so it's a pretty big deal for so many to go back and dust off their consoles. GameStop even revealed that Metroid Dread was their most pre-ordered title post E3, so it seems Metroid fans will certainly bite if the line is cast for their attention. Speaking of Metroid Fusion, there's a small but rather interesting mistake that has been observed by Spencer PK on the cutting room floor. As a result of a glitch that occurs in the game's programming, Samus's left wall jump sprites in-game for some reason do not display her left arm something that is a result of a rendering error, as internally these sprites do feature her left arm, with the issue not being demonstrated in her right wall jump sprites. 
other, perhaps more prolific series from Nintendo have their own unseen or unheard portions of their data that the player may otherwise never come across. One of these is the Game Boy Advance launch title, Super Mario Advance, which has development files containing a number of voice samples for Mario, Luigi, Peach, and Toad. In these unused voice clips, the characters all laugh in bizarre, possibly intentionally unusual sounding ways. <laughs> Where these clips would have been used in the final product are unknown. Nintendo would follow this up with Super Mario Advance 2, which has a couple of funky behaviors in its final release that are clearly unintended. By pressing left and select on the same frame while at Donut Plains 2 on the world map, and then warping to Yoshi's house, Mario will be taken to a version of the game's introduction cutscene, but populated by a collection of enemies with glitched graphics. This includes creatures such as Super Cooper with triangle heads, or a Pokey using Rex sprites for the head and Mega Mole sprites for its body segments. We mentioned earlier how some games can find themselves in a soft-locked state, with the only solution to resolve the issue being to reset the system. But Super Mario Advance 2 contains a sort of pseudo-lock glitch that can actually be resolved with severe perseverance. By performing a similar glitch to that previously mentioned, the player will find themselves on a graphically buggy level, which when completed will create a complete mess on the player's screen. This glitch fest will ultimately resolve itself, but not until an entire three hours have passed. This mess occurs due to an extremely long glitched out creating a path on the map cutscene, which takes three hours to unfold, and keeps on going even when the player is zooming around levels. But like we said, it will clear up eventually. Sometimes international revisions can drastically change the context of certain scenes, like in Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. In the original Japanese release of the game, one of the game's opening scenes involves Sid, who can be seen sitting alone in the street in a drunken state. He approaches Mute and the rest of the party as they pass by, telling them all about the wonders of alcohol, before walking back home three sheets to the wind. In the North American and European releases of the games, however, this scene is substantially different, with Sid apologizing to and being reprimanded by somebody, presumably his boss, with no dialogue making reference to his drinking. Presumably, this scene went through some revisioning, to the point of introducing a new character with their own NPC portrait as a means of trying to keep the game's E for Everyone maturity rating, demonstrating a difference between content that would have been deemed acceptable within differing regions. Mother 3 is quite well known for having gone through drastic changes during its development, having originally been created as a Nintendo 64 game before transitioning over to the GBA. The game's natural killer cyborg boss, or NK Cyborg, performs a signature attack called End of the Century Beam. With Earthbound 64 having been set to release in 1999, it seems that the End of the Century Beam was intended as a nod to the fact that the century was coming to an end in the real world around the game's original intended release, and the name simply went unchanged. One could take this information as the developers lacking a certain degree of foresight, but another fact about the game would show that they certainly weren't lacking in this department. In Chapter 2, during the cutscene that occurs just before Kumatora joins the player's party as a permanent member, she fires a PK Freeze Alpha attack on Duster and Wes as they enter the stairwell she was in, after failing to recognize who they were. The cutscene then plays out and she joins the team. Checking her status will reveal that she has 68 PP out of 73, 5 PP short of her maximum. PK Freeze Alpha costs 5 PP to cast, meaning that the developers had considered this scene when she joins the party without a fully charged PP meter. This is just one of those small details that makes Mother 3 such a great game. We think it's about time for more exclusive GBA trivia now. A while back, we were contacted by Michelle Flitman, daughter of video game producer Mark Flitman. Mark worked on dozens of titles, including Maximum Carnage, Virtual Bart, Nightshade, Slugfest, and the game we're going to be talking about today, Dragon Ball Z Boo's Fury. After these games had finished development, Mark would keep hold of some of the production materials like concept art, design documents, and probably of most interest, early builds of games. 
After sorting through some of her dad's belongings, Michelle found a bag of unlabeled GBA cartridges with a few work-in-progress cards of Boo's Fury. She was kind enough to send us some images from them, along with a few tidbits about the various early builds. Some of the early content in these versions are just placeholders, like this sketch avatar, which comes from an early build of the game where many portraits seem to be scans of manga pages or reference art. Or this goofy-looking unfinished portrait of Goku, or even this cute cat picture that's from a build of the game where all the portraits were, well, this cat. Then there's other content like these unused early title screens that clue us in to how the game's name changed during development. One early title screen has the game's original name, Dragon Ball Z, The Legacy of Goku 3, while the second screen has the unused subtitle Dragon Ball Z Fusion. As far as we can tell, these title screens aren't documented anywhere online, and they're pretty cool to see. Mark is actually releasing a book sometime in the near future with limited-run games documenting his time in the games industry. So if you're interested in more behind-the-scenes secrets like this, look out for a book titled It's Not All Fun and Games. We have some more exclusive trivia at the end of the video, but first, some facts from one of Nintendo's most inventive sub-series. They say the best things come in threes, take note Valve, like the varying difficulties of WarioWare Inc. Mega Micro Games, where each micro game has three varying difficulties to be played in. Interestingly, however, the game's code includes functionality to have even more difficulties than this. And through modification, it's possible to see otherwise unseen states for certain micro games. Setting the game's level over three in the The Brush Off micro game will result in some unseen behavior. Normally, the teeth are mildly stained on the easiest difficulty and heavily stained on the hardest difficulty, with each brush lightening the teeth until they're white. But on higher unintended difficulties, the teeth go beyond a dark brownish yellow and will become a green or even blue at the start. A mistake can also be found in WarioWare, which results in the third level to the Right in the Eye micro game being impossible to win. The game will place the eye of the needle low on the screen, making it impossible for the player's hand to be low enough to thread the needle, even if down is held the entire time. Games go through many iterations before release, and with advertising for games often starting during development, it's possible to spot changes made to the final product. Golden Sun demonstrates some of these changes in early screenshots, with some material showing that Jenna's conception as a character took place fairly late in the game's creation. Pre-release screenshots show Mia in the place that Jenna would wind up taking. Early artwork for the game also shows Mia, Garrett, and Isaac in front of Mount Aleph, with neither Jenna or Ivan being shown. Within the game's code, dummied out character positions can be found for both Felix and Sheba, though they wind up going unused and neither is playable at any point. These two characters would wind up being present in the sequel, however. Another unused playable character position can also be found dummied out for PC-07. By editing the game's save file, it's possible to reinsert these characters into the player's party, though doing so won't render any favorable results. All of them have entirely zeroed out stats with a class label of NPC. Felix and PC-07 have no small sprite, though Shiba does, but she will always face sideways. Only Felix and Shiba have a dedicated portrait for the game's status menu, with PC-07 simply displaying the last portrait seen. In battles, PC-07's portrait is visible in the status menu, showing an otherwise unused portrait of Alex. These unused characters will all use the Vermin battle sprite, but won't be capable of fighting, even if modified to have positive stat points. Unused characters are not the only parts of the game's code that go unused, with there being several synergy attacks also left in the data, though inaccessible. Some of these attacks are fully coded, status-inducing skills, which wound up never being assigned to any of the game's class's movesets, while some others indicate status effects that were also cut and never implemented. Mario Tennis Power Tour was also created by Golden Sun's development team at Camelot, which explains some of the references to Golden Sun being seen in the sports title, such as the custom defensive power shots, which causes a giant hand to appear and catch the ball, the same giant hand used to move objects in Golden Sun. Camelot clearly also wanted to show love to another of Nintendo's franchises, though, with one of the game's NPCs saying, They say if you do a lot of practice swings, a great fairy appears to reward you. 
I fell for it at first, but it's a secret to everybody, if you know what I mean. Alluding to the great fairies of the Legend of Zelda series, and the extremely recognisable line, it's a secret to everybody. It turns out, though, the great fairy does appear if you practice your swing enough, though it may not be the same great fairy from the Zelda series. Some sequels weren't ever intended to be a sequel in the first place, like Mega Man Zero 4. At one stage, the game was set to be almost a completely different title altogether. Rather than continue the story where the plot of Mega Man Zero 3 had left off, Inti Creates president Takuya Aizu wanted to create something along the lines of a Mega Man Zero 1.5. This would have been an attempt to fill in the gaps to the story that occur between the first and second games in the series. Capcom, however, insisted that they instead create a true Zero Four. The main bosses of Mega Man Zero Four, the Ein Hajar Eight Warriors, were all based on mythological creatures, with their real-world mythology slotting in nicely with the game's setting. These include a fairy, a mandragora, a minotaur, a cockatrice, a pegasus, a kraken, the Norse Fenrir, and the black tortoise Genbu. Their connection to the game's plot comes from the Ein Hajar in Norse mythology being warriors brought to Valhalla to await Ragnarok, when they would join in an immense battle. In Zero Four, the Ein Hajar are engaging in an operation dubbed Ragnarok to eliminate the human settlement that Zero aims to protect. Another underappreciated title for the Game Boy Advance is Drill Dozer. Although it was developed by the very well-known Game Freak, it never quite hit the big leagues and just sort of stayed in Pokémon's shadow. However, this didn't stop the team from wanting to show as much love as they could for their earlier works, as well as Nintendo in general. This can be seen with unlockable alternate outfits for the game's protagonist, Jill, which are shown on the game's menu screens, though not during the main gameplay. These include schoolgirl clothes, the same outfit as that worn by the female hero in Pokemon Fire Red and Leaf Green, a pair of blue overalls that can be unlocked, which are based on Mario's signature blue dungarees and red shirt, with additional beads in her hair featuring the iconic spotted mushroom. Her futuristic clothes outfit is based on the much earlier Game Freak title Pulse Man, released for the Sega Genesis, a frog suit, which is assumed to just be based on the frog suit in Super Mario Bros. 3, and lastly, a nurse uniform based on the character Misaki Hayama, a nurse from the Japanese exclusive Game Freak title Click Plus Medic, released for the PlayStation. Ratatouille released on just about every system under the sun, but the Game Boy Advance version is easily the most interesting version of the game, having a unique mix of top-down and side-scrolling exploration. The data for the American version of the GBA release suggests that a Japanese version of the game was planned. However, because the GBA was discontinued the previous year in that country, the Japanese localization was cancelled. Another interesting secret is that several rather vulgar passwords can be found in the Game Boy Advance version's files. All of the passwords, except for Bitch K! are six characters or less, compared to the seven character passwords used for the game. Using Bitch K! won't do anything, however, making this also unused. Another set of passwords also reference various developers who worked on the game, including Bill Bullard, Jason Cruz, Juan Diaz, Eric Orr, Andrew Godzigler Ziegler, Xavier Javanek, and Michael Krentz. Some other games have secret passwords, such as Super Monkey Ball Jr. Here, passwords can be entered on the game's title screen, which also serve as Easter eggs. If the player enters the combination up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A at the title screen, the game's logo will change to say Super Nice Try instead of Super Monkey Ball Jr. This button combination is, of course, the Konami code. The player can also enter the combination left, left, right, right, down, down, A. This will change the logo to say Super Block Mode, which you might have guessed makes the entire game look blockier. This effect persists until the game is reset. And although it's less of an Easter egg, the player can also enter down, down, up, up, left, right, left, right, B, A, the opposite of the Konami code, to unlock everything in the game. This will change the title screen, which now says Super Enable All. Speaking of Konami Easter eggs, Castlevania Aria of Sorrow actually has an entire enemy dedicated to being nothing more than an Easter egg, the Kicker Skeleton. The enemy wears a red scarf and attacks by leaping into the air with its arms outstretched, then delivering a flying kick. These two elements reference the Japanese superhero Kamen Rider, who's known for his flying kick finishing move and his red scarf. 
If Soma acquires the Kicker Skeleton's soul, he'll gain a Flying Kick ability. The enemy also has a chance to drop a wearable red scarf and Ancient Belt items. The Ancient Belt alludes to the many belts that give the common Riders their powers. Its description explains that it lends the wearer a positive attitude, a reference to Kamen Rider Kuga, whose belt, the Arkel, was not only an artifact from an ancient civilization, but who's also characterized by his unusually upbeat and optimistic personality. The Ancient Belt item's box-like design also mirrors Kamen Rider Black's belt, the Kingstone. Ironically, neither Kamen Rider Black nor Kamen Rider Kuga wore scarves, unlike many of the early riders. Konami clearly loves making these sorts of references. The Boktai games, for example, are overflowing with references to other Konami titles. Two solar gun frames in the original Boktai refer to games published by Konami. These are the Gradius, named after the series of side-scrolling shoot-em-ups, and the Beatmania frames, named after Konami's series of music games. The former offers rapid shots, while the latter fires shots that make loud sounds on impact. Boktai 2 also has a sneaky reference to the Metal Gear franchise. In the game, the player can acquire the Skull Suit, which lets players sneak by enemies more effectively. In Metal Gear Solid 2, the sneaking suit worn by Raiden during the Big Shell incident was also known as the Skull Suit due to its appearance. And now it's time for our last piece of exclusive GBA trivia. Last year, we translated issue 84 of Nintendo Dream Magazine into English for the first time, and talked about some of its contents in a video all about the third generation of Pokemon games. The interview included Junichi Masuda and Ken Sugimori, and covered things like how Blaziken was designed to look ugly, and how Slackoth got motivated when it evolved into Vigoroth, then decided the effort wasn't worth it, and evolved into slacking. But there's a few more facts that we left aside just for a rainy day. One of these facts is how much the team struggled to stay motivated during development. In the interview, Masuda states that partly due to having a development team of 30, after two years, they all started to lose steam. Devs would regularly ask, how much longer till we can say we're finished? And they all had to psych themselves up for work by shouting, come on, let's do this. And the process of making the Pokemon designs themselves seems to have been demoralizing too. Sugimori mentions how a lot of the Pokemon had a troubled development. As art director, Sugimori would finalize all the Pokemon made by other members of staff so that the Pokedex was consistent. But there were points where he didn't have them all unified yet, and had to put them into playable builds mid-development. Then he'd get feedback from testers in Nintendo's Super Mario Club that the creatures didn't look like Pokemon. Sugimori said, There was a long period where I felt like, yeah, I, I know that, you don't need to keep saying it. That was pretty draining, spiritually. The basic designs were there, but they lacked polish, and the testers would point it out constantly. The Game Boy Advance brought us some amazing 2D titles, and impressively, even some 3D ones. The Advance truly pushed the portable gaming scene, though with the standard of today's portable systems, that may seem hard to believe for some of our younger viewers. As laughable as it may seem, the idea of having more than just a few colours on screen was pretty impressive at the time, even if they were hard to see thanks to the original Game Boy Advance lacking a backlight. Luckily, Nintendo recognised this fault and released the Game Boy Advance SP, which is still among one of their best portable devices to this day, taking up a ridiculously compact form factor and looking pretty damn spicy if we do say so ourselves. Of course, any good system needs good games, and the Game Boy Advance had them in droves. Many ports hit the system, like the Donkey Kong Country series, but new franchises also came along, like Golden Sun. And of course, Nintendo would release new entries for Mario, Metroid, and Pokemon. We'll start by going over Donkey Kong Country's releases, as Rare didn't just simply port the titles over, they actually gave them some new features. In Donkey Kong Country 3, Rare included a bunch of extra minigames as post-game content. What makes these minigames genuinely interesting, however, is that they're all based on an earlier and lesser-known Rare title for the NES titled Cobra Triangle. Cobra Triangle was a 1989 racing slash vehicular combat game where players control a weapon-equipped speedboat through 25 levels, with various objectives such as winning races, saving swimmers, and defusing bombs. 
Cobra Triangle's music was notably created by David Wise, who also helmed the score for the Donkey Kong Country series. But of course, the original Donkey Kong Country on the Game Boy Advance also had some new touches. When the player enters Cranky's Cabin, a few references to other Rare games can be seen scattered around as well. Mumbo Jumbo's mask from Banjo-Kazooie is sitting on a barrel in the foreground. Saber Wolf from the Game Boy Advance game of the same name has his head mounted on the wall, and a barely distinguishable picture on the wall is apparently the cast of Rare's Xbox title grabbed by the Ghoulies, though it's probably safe to say that not many people really notice this one. Speaking of Rare, we recently talked about Banjo Pilot in our every cancelled Game Boy Advance game video, and how the game was once Diddy Kong Pilot, but was heavily reworked after Rare was purchased by Microsoft. One thing we didn't mention in that video, however, was how an early build of the game actually featured a number of playable Mario characters. The characters in question were Mario, Peach, Yoshi, Wario, Bowser, and Toad, and they even had their own unique planes. Whether the initial plans included having these characters appear as playable characters is unknown, but it's very likely that Nintendo would have been reluctant to lend these characters for a third-party developed racing game when they are all prominently featured in Mario Kart. What's funny, however, is that considering the demo was Diddy Kong Pilot, the roster of this early build actually features more Mario characters than it does characters from the Donkey Kong franchise. So far, this video has been a bit Rare-centric, so let's take a quick detour to look at a game in the Mario, or rather, Wario series. Wario Land 4 was a pretty incredible game that pushed the Wario Land series onto more advanced hardware, and in doing so delivered more advanced audio. Vocals were actually used for the game's title track and ending sequence, something that wouldn't have been an option for handheld games before the Game Boy Advance released. Part of the vocals were actually taken from the first track of an audio sample compilation CD called Zero G's Vocal XTC, which involved a variety of lines being sung by British session singer Helen Binding. One prominent line is, Your time is over, I've had enough, here I come, here I come, look out, here I come. This line was cut up and used in the Wario Land 4 theme, of course, with a bit of quality loss. This interesting tidbit was first documented on the Wario forums and didn't receive much attention from anywhere besides the Mario Wiki. Another title on the Game Boy Advance starring Mario seemed to many people as a bit of a strange game at the time of its release. Seemingly coming out of the blue, Mario Pinball Land sees the player take control of Mario as he lives his best life as a ball. Adrian Barrett and Richard Horrocks, two developers with a track record of having created several successful pinball games in the past, founded their own game development studio called Fuse Games, and after doing so, decided to try and pitch a new pinball game to Nintendo. But the duo knew they'd need something substantial to win Nintendo's favour, and decided to create a demo consisting of what they figured would be the first and last areas of the game. Afterwards, they travelled to Seattle to pitch the game to Nintendo of America, and despite the odds, this new upstart studio was allowed to work on a Mario game. They decided to develop the title for the Game Boy Advance rather than the GameCube, as Fuse Games' team had somewhat limited resources, and because of the system's similarities to more comfortable hardware for the developers, the SNES. Mario Pinball Land was the studio's first commercial project, taking 18 months to develop with a staff of just five people in total. Initially, the game was developed with the title Mario Pinball, but eventually the land was added, likely to give the game's name a bit more flair and fit the naming convention of handheld Mario titles. Going back to another rare developed title, Banjo-Kazooie Grunty's Revenge actually went through a number of changes during development, revealed from an early prototype version of the game. Of particular note, the developers shaved off one-seventh of the game's total notes and jiggies, reducing the total from 700 notes to 670 jiggies to 60. Paul Rame, a former programmer for the game, has spoken as well about how red feathers were removed from the game entirely, which would have given the player the ability to fly. He claims that the reason for their removal was because of numerous complaints about the feature, including the camera's deceiving perspective and some issues with scenery collision detection extending above the object on older maps, creating invisible walls and making movement extremely frustrating. 
Some characters were also set to be included, but were cut from the final release, with a UFO type character appearing in the game's prototype, which isn't found in the retail release. A character not just set to have movement graphics, but a dialogue icon, suggesting a more involved role than just an enemy. In the retail cartridge is a set of graphics which go unused as well, revealing that at some stage, Boggy, a recurring character in the series, was going to appear at some point. It's unknown why he was removed. While some games had lots of changes, others struggled to make any at all. For Metroid Fusion, spacefaring bounty hunter Samus Aran got a new look. Game director and writer Yoshio Sakamoto revealed in a 2003 interview that the first designers he handed the project to came back with the outrageous desire to change Samus's design. He stated, It's been the same way for way too long, but changing the design of the hero of the game is a big deal, right? They were going to really need to convince us. Even though Samus's design from Super Smash Bros. was popular, it was still no small thing to deliberately change her traditional Metroid design. That's why I told them that if they were going to change it, they'd need to introduce some new element, and a good justification for it. I told the team that deliberately changing Samus's design was nothing to take lightly. So, rather than have them thinking about simply changing her design, I tried to get them thinking about new gameplay elements they could introduce, and the necessity of having a solid reason in-game for doing so. This resulted in the creation of the Fusion Suit, giving Samus a new blue edge. The suit is a stripped-down version of Samus's classic power suit, after the suit's organic parts bonded to her body, with the majority of it being surgically removed during the game's opening. Another title that was crafted with lots of love was the much-beloved JRPG Golden Sun. When it came to designing the world within the game, it's not all too surprising that the inspiration for landmasses came from the real world around us. When exploring the world of Wayard, you may have noticed that continents such as Gondawan bear a remarkably similar geography and culture to Africa. Even the name of Gondawan is likely a reference to the origins of the continent. Gondwana Land, or Gondwana, was the ancient supercontinent that incorporated Africa, South America, Antarctica, Australia, and the regions of India and the Arabian Peninsula. Other regions of Golden Sun's world reference locations in the real world too, with Angara being similar to Europe, as well as continental East Asia and the Near East. Indra has similarities to India. Oceania being similar to Oceania and Australia, Hesperia is inhabited by people resembling the North American Native Americans, Ateca takes on similarities to South America, and Tundaria is a frigid cold land not dissimilar to Antarctica. And while we're talking about beloved RPGs, let's jump over to a much talked about game, Pokemon Emerald. Although Emerald, and Generation 3 in general, have been talked about to death, the game still has a few secrets that aren't all that well known. One interesting tidbit is that the order that your rival, either Brendan or May, sends out their Pokémon during battle is entirely determined by which gender they are, and by extension, is also determined by which gender the player chose for their own character before their adventure even started. However, for reasons unknown, this only works if the starter the rival chose was Trico, and doesn't come into effect if they chose Torchic or Mudkip. The Game Boy Advance has so many good games on it, and they even managed to outlast the console that they were made for. Thanks to Nintendo's keen interest in backwards compatibility for their handheld systems, the Nintendo DS gave players access to not just the newest DS titles, but they could continue to enjoy the backlog of games released for the GBA. A godsend for many, particularly those strapped for cash, as having a new system that could play older games means that the legacy of some of the Game Boy Advance's most iconic titles could live on with those who have a tight budget, or who were simply curious about the past. They could try out great games like WarioWare, Castlevania Circle of the Moon, Fire Emblem, Zelda the Minish Cap and Four Swords, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, and even Pokemon's Pinball spin-off. These are just some of the titles we'll be talking about in this episode, with our first splash landing in the world of microgame mania. WarioWare Inc. Mega Microgames was a pretty dramatic change for Wario's position within Nintendo's library of games, giving him his own incredibly distinct cast of supporting characters, and leaving players with no mistakes that Wario is a comedic element of the Mario franchise. That humor can be found throughout WarioWare, and ranges from being on the nose to being pretty well hidden, such as one reference that requires some extra effort one may not think to put in. 
after clearing the first set of Wario's micro games, the player can then play them again endlessly. Doing so means that the player can repeatedly beat the boss of this stage, which will present them with a short animation of Wario resting on a sofa watching TV. It's actually possible for the player to turn the TV on during this animation by pressing the A button, revealing what Wario is watching. After beating the boss on the third difficulty cycle, the words thank you for playing appears instead of rest, and by turning on the TV, a smartly dressed businessman with glasses will be revealed. Though this isn't, of course, just any businessman, it is in fact the great iconic visage of the late Nintendo president Satoru Iwata. But this isn't the game's only secret. Another reference comes in during the staff roll, which lets the player change the shape of stars that fly past the screen through button inputs. If the player press down the down button on the game's controller, the stars will turn into small Triforces from the Legend of Zelda series, while pressing the right direction will change them into the GameCube logo instead. Another series that made quite the impression on GBA is Konami's Castlevania series, and Circle of the Moon has its own reference to another, earlier title released by the publisher, though this time around, some players may have never even known the game they were referencing. A wearable item dropped by the skeleton medalist is the Bear Ring, a ring which the game describes as holding the Curse of the Bear. It may appear to be a rather useless item all in all, providing them with a loss of 100 strength, defense, intelligence, and luck, suggesting the player shouldn't use it for lack of any real benefit. However, if the player does equip this item at the same time as activating the dual setup combination of Pluto and Black Dog, rather than the usual effect of turning into a skeleton, they will instead turn into a cartoonish green bear called Bear Tank. Bear Tank is actually a character that appeared in an earlier Konami title, Rakuga Kids, a 2.5D fighting game released for the Nintendo 64 in 1998. We actually covered the game on region, if you want to check it out. The game was only ever published in Japan and PAL territories, so he's not too recognizable to US audiences, but he has made appearances in other Konami titles as well, including Konami Crazy Racers for GBA. This transformation in Circle of the Moon is considered to actually still be pretty useless, as though it does have some unique and rather interesting attacks, his damage is still well below that of Nathan's human form, and he will die in just a single blow. In reality, this item is nothing more than a joke, but as a lover of the bear tank, we can't say it's an unwelcome one. Another series of games which had little acknowledgement overseas is the legendary Starfy series, probably as a result of most of the games in the series never getting an international release. The first game, Densetsu no Starfy, originally began its life being developed for the Game Boy all the way back in 1995, before eventually having development moved to the Game Boy Color in 1998 before it was shifted once again, shortly before its completion, to the new GBA hardware in 1999. Because of all of these shifts in the game's long production, it wasn't even released until 2002, a seven-year development period. The series as a whole wouldn't have any release in the West at all until the fifth entry on the Nintendo DS, released as the legendary Starfy. But one of Starfy's adventures on the GBA did have some recognizable faces in it. In Densetsu no Starfy 3, Wario himself is prominently featured within the game's eighth world, giving them treasures such as a copy of WarioWare Inc. with an actual GBA, and teaching Starfy how to use his shooting star ability. Moving from an obscure franchise to a huge one, Nintendo had a pretty rocky start with its international adoption of the Fire Emblem franchise. Even when Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade managed to be localized around the globe, it still found itself in a spot of bother, with every version of the game having its own unique errors in their dialogue. In the original Japanese version, Lin as a Blade Lord will incorrectly be shown using her regular battle sprites and animations if she is wielding the Soul Katai, as a result of the animations being assigned to Durandal. This error was fixed when the game was localized elsewhere, but other issues will crop up instead. With the North American release of the game, all dialogue mentioning Aenir has some sort of translation error, with the character sometimes being referred to as a location instead of a person. One character straight up says, Daddy has to go to Aenir, I'm going to get Mummy. 
But the issues don't just stop there, as the English language mode of both European releases adds its own unusual error on the wild map sequence of Chapter 16XE or 17XH, where the game's script will suddenly drop the English language in place of Italian. This mistake isn't that the game suddenly points the game to read from the Italian language script instead, but rather it is part of the English text, as it even occurs in another release of the game in Europe which didn't actually include an Italian language option. Fire Emblem may be huge these days, but an even bigger Nintendo series is The Legend of Zelda. Unused code is always fun to unearth in games, and one particularly fun game is the Minish Cap. Lon Lon Milk makes an appearance in this pocket adventure, which serves only to heal the player out in the field, but it seems as though there may have been another function for this item entirely in earlier builds. Unused data suggests that, at least at one stage, Link would have been able to churn Lon Lon Milk into butter, with a chunk of unused text which reads, Your Lon Lon Milk turned into butter. It's very fresh and delicious. With that said, the conditions required to turn the milk into butter aren't made obvious, but it would seem likely that Link was supposed to have taken the Lon Lon milk to a particular character to have it churned, but who that is isn't all too clear. It's possible that they too were also removed before the game's final release, but one Minish found in the Minish village can produce Picolite for Link, a substance that increases the rate of finding certain items. To create a variety of different colors of Picolite and make them available for Link to purchase, the player must bring them the correct ingredients, with one of these ingredients being Long Long Milk, in order to unlock Yellow Picolite. This is a particularly interesting item to have to deliver, as it isn't particularly hard to come by, unlike the rest of the items needed for the other colours. So it may be that in an early version of the game, Link would have had to churn Lon Lon Milk into Lon Lon Butter and deliver it to unlock Yellow Picolite instead. The Minish Cap also has many connections with another Zelda title on GBA, Four Swords. One of the new enemies created for Four Swords was the rather irritating Rupee Wraith, a ghost-like creature that pursues Link after being let out of its treasure chest hiding spot. Rather than take out Link's health, the Wraith instead starts to drain the player's Rupee count, but the Rupee Wraith actually makes another appearance in the Minish Cap. There was a different being entirely, sharing a sprite with the ghost which haunts Greagle. The Rupee Wraith's squealing sounds can also be heard in the Minish Cap, having been given to the big Octorok boss. But other data from Four Swords appears in the Minish Cap, though goes entirely unused. Both Zoles and Gels appear to have been considered for the game at some stage, but they remain dormant in Minish Cap's data. One interesting tidbit comes from the Zol boss of Four Swords. An interesting part of this boss comes in its name, Dera Zol, with Dera appearing to be a shortening of Dorai, a Japanese word for immense or awesome, meaning this boss's name essentially translates into Awesome Zol. The Bomberosa enemy also has an interesting name, originating from the term Bomba Rosa, which when translated from Italian means Red Bomb, though this name is only used in the game's English localization. In fact, not only is this name used in the game's English releases, but the Italian translation of the game actually uses the original Japanese name Bombu, possibly to obscure the enemy's name from being a bit too obvious to Italian speakers. Now, the Game Boy Advance's Pokemon offerings saw massive success, like it had before and as it would continue to do. But before we dive into those mainline titles, let's take a look at a spin-off that sold well in its own right. Many have fond memories of playing Pokemon Pinball, Ruby and Sapphire on their GBAs in the early 2000s. And by many, we mean a great deal, with the game selling around a million units worldwide. But there was another version of this game, a far, far more exclusive experience that only a few got to try. At least one full-size pinball machine based on the game was produced by Personal Pinball Link for Pokemon USA. It was ultimately housed at the New York Pokemon Center, and Personal Pinball were so proud of it, they featured it on their company flyer. This physical version seems to take elements from both boards featured in the GBA game. 
As for the game that this pinball spin-off is based on, Ruby and Sapphire showed a resurging presence in 2020 as well, all thanks to a pair of fish. In May 2020, a Japanese livestreamer began a lengthy series using his two pet Siamese fighting fish to play through Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire using a system involving several programs connected to the game's emulator. These programs rely on a webcam to track the fish's movements and determine what individual action to perform by where it swims over a map placed behind the fish tank. So wherever the fish swims, it blocks a map square with a picture of a controller input on it and the system performs said input in-game. On October 3rd, 2020, during a live stream of Pokemon Sapphire, one of the fish was working on a boulder puzzle in the seafloor cavern on Route 128 when it performed a very rare glitch that appeared to have not been widely known in the past. The fish used strength on a boulder, which moved it and additionally created a duplicate boulder in its place, making the puzzle unsolvable until the room was reset. The streamer later figured out how to trigger the glitch himself, and uploaded a step-by-step -step guide to YouTube on how to perform it. Amazingly, another fish that belonged to the owner found another glitch a few months later. This time, the glitch happened during a stream of Pokemon Crystal, where the player picked up an item through a wall. The Game Boy Advance was amazing. It was a great step forward for all of us who enjoyed gaming on the go, with top-notch titles like Metroid Fusion, Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire, and Golden Sun. But for as advanced as a portable gaming system could get, some of its games had a fair few mistakes. And when we highlight these mistakes, we aren't trying to comment on the quality of the entertainment that comes from any of these games. This is just a fun look at some errors that made their way into games on one of Nintendo's best handhelds. This includes titles that remain the gold standard to this day, save for a few mistakes we're about to mention, such as Pokemon Emerald, Mega Man Battle Network, Digimon Battle Spirit, and even the Japanese exclusive Mother 3. Each of these games demonstrated that there's no reason to dismiss 2D as a viable option for creating engrossing experiences, even if those experiences take place on a 240 by 160 pixel screen. We'll be talking about these titles and a few more in this episode, but let's start off with a popular GBA Dragon Ball Z title. While it's considered to be quite a popular game among Dragon Ball fans, that doesn't stop mistakes cropping up in the GBA RPG Dragon Ball Z The Legacy of Goku. As a result of the game's somewhat rocky development, it's unsurprising that there were a few issues with the game. One of these involves the player's movement. If the player is hit by a key blast whilst they are in flight mode, they should be pushed out of flight mode. But in doing so, the flight counter will still be visible on screen. And not just that, but the player becomes invincible, only losing this power when they enter a different location. This, as you might imagine, leads to some parts of the game becoming incredibly trivial. Another mistake to do with locations occurs in the northwest section of the map, where the Ginyu Force reside. It's possible in this area to actually skip this segment entirely, as a result of a misplaced warp in this corner. This was very likely a mistake from the game's developers, as you're supposed to fight the Ginyu Force to progress the story, and the warp isn't even on land. But when it comes to the fourth entry in a series where every precious release has been translated into English with at least decent accuracy, you might expect better with this next title. Mega Man Battle Network 4, Red Sun and Blue Moon are now infamous for their lack of polish when it comes to their in-game dialogue, not just because of its wide array of grammatical errors, but also due to a good number of obvious spelling mistakes. Throughout the game, characters will refer to multiple viruses as A-viruses or viruses is instead of A-virus or viruses are. There are low-level mistakes as well, such as casually mixing up two and two, or simply spell-checking mistakes for words, with a huge variety of single-letter mistakes like, it looks live we've been kidnapped, and loosing the dark chip and shade men. Of course, along with these are lines which are just poorly translated in multiple ways, like Mega Man is the jack out now. But with a huge library of games, Mega Man Battle Network 4 isn't the only game on the GBA to have some issues with its translation. Harvest Moon, Friends of Mineral Town is considered to be one of the best in the series, but even this game has some problems with its English language section. At one point in the game, the player is given the opportunity to tell NPCs about a job at a winery. When speaking with the town's priest, Carter, the opportunity to tell him about the job is somewhat obscured, as the options to tell him will be written in German for some reason. These choices, when translated, are tell about the job or don't tell. 
If the player decides to let Carter know about the job, he will even respond in German as well. Which, when translated, reads, A part-time job at the winery sounds like a lot of fun. But, you know, since this is an English version of the game, this is less than ideal. Next up, let's talk about Fire Emblem. This GBA Fire Emblem entry decided that for its North American release, it would drop its subtitle, The Blazing Blade, likely as a way of not intimidating new players who weren't accustomed to the franchise. At this point, Fire Emblem was almost entirely known in the Western world due to Marth and Roy's inclusion in Super Smash Bros. Melee, which was one reason this title even saw an English release at all. Being released after The Binding Blade, a Japanese exclusive GBA release, you'd assume that this game would have made improvements over their earlier entry, but there were clearly some mistakes during its development. One of these mistakes occurs with the ballista weapon used by archers, which usually has the game display no animation for their attacks, despite the fact that there is animation for the archers using the ballista in the game's data. Why these animations weren't used is unknown. This is a particularly confusing aspect of unused data, as they'd already been used in Sword of Seals, but they were either cut or forgotten. Another error occurs in this entry of Fire Emblem, the previous game in the series revealed that Vault is actually the son of Rebecca, but since The Blazing Blade is a prequel, it's possible to create a paradox. Rebecca is a playable character in Blazing Blade, and it's possible for her health to reach zero and thus be subject to permadeath, preventing Vault from ever being born. Perhaps this is a bit nitpicky, but it's likely just an oversight by the Fire Emblem team, as if they had considered this, they would either have likely flagged Rebecca as being unable to be dealt permadeath in the previous game, or would have given Vault a different mother. We mentioned that Fire Emblem on the GBA was the first in the series to be localized into English, so some mistakes are to be expected. This next piece of trivia has been mentioned on this channel many years ago, but we wanted to include it to increase its posterity and raise awareness of just how great a man Stuart Gilray was. Pinball Challenge Deluxe was a simple port of two earlier pinball games for the Amiga, Pinball Dreams, and Pinball Fantasies, two beloved pinball titles still considered to be the crowning jewel of their generation. According to the late and great Stuart Gilray, who worked as the Director of Development at the time of the game's releases, hardware issues sprang up which were out of the development team's control upon publication. The game fails to save any data at all when it's turned off, despite the fact that the team had included a save feature in the game's code. Gilray explained, We created the game to allow saves, etc. But for some reason, I'm guessing budgetary, Ubisoft at the last minute decided to not manufacture the game with EEPROM save memory. Stuart Gilray also went on to state that saving the game does work when using a flashcard or if the game is played through emulation, and that he would encourage people that play it to play it on a backup cart just so to allow saving. Rest in peace, Stuart, you were a real one. Some mistakes in games aren't so detrimental to the player, and really, you could probably just ignore them or not even notice them at all. This is the case for a mistake that shows up in Digimon Battle Spirit. The game is undoubtedly a very well-produced love letter to the Digimon series, and is also a port of an earlier game released exclusively in Japan for the Wonderswan. But this doesn't mean that the team didn't make some mistakes along the way. The game's final boss, Millenniumon, is incorrectly depicted in-game as having two red fingers, despite official artwork showing him as only having one on the top of his left hand. This wasn't a new mistake introduced to the GBA, but also appeared in the earlier release, but apparently the devs failed to spot it a second time when bringing it to the Nintendo handheld. So far, we've mentioned a lot of translations and Japanese exclusives, but this next piece is about a game which never received an official translation and has always remained in Japan save for a very high quality fan translation, of course, it's Mother 3. It is in this instance that a mistake simply led to a fun little Easter egg. In Chapter 7, when a hooded Mr. Saturn gives the player back the Courage Badge, Mr. Saturn says goodbye to the player and walks a few spaces off screen where it is supposed to stop and disappear. However, due to a bug, he will remain in that spot, just a few spaces away from the player. Itoi revealed in an interview that he actually liked this bug, so he decided to keep it there and write some text for him. Because he's not a bug, he's a feature. Another popular Game Boy Advance RPG is, and you probably guessed this one by now, it's Pokemon. And this time, we're looking at Emerald Edition. This mistake is a bit of a doozy, one which really can ruin your day, but in all likelihood will never happen unless you go out of your way to do it to yourself. 
Through taking a series of complex and absurd steps, as demonstrated by YouTuber Pika's Prey, it's possible to cause the game to completely softlock. By performing these steps, the game will essentially force the player into a situation where they have no money or resources, and no means of acquiring more money or mons. And with only one Pokemon, a level 100 Electrode that only knows a single move, self-destruct. If this is done correctly, then the player can find themselves stuck at the Pokemon League building, unable to progress and unable to retreat. This softlock is not possible to recreate in the Generation 6 remakes released on the 3DS, however, not that it would be much consolation if you managed to get yourself stuck on the GBA title. Did you know? Mother 3 was conceived during a stressful period before Earthbound's launch. Series creator Shigesato Atoy believed that most RPGs were structured like road trip movies, and wanted to switch up the formula and set a game in a single town that changes over time. Atoy's first idea for a protagonist was a detective who'd solve crimes while living above a supermarket. The character would attempt to solve a murder, but could only progress by building relationships with the townspeople. Because of this, Atoy prized minor details. For example, a woman hanging out washing would be seen wearing clean clothes the next day. Shigeru Miyamoto compared the concept to that of Majora's Mask, which used a similar mechanic. Satoru Iwata, producer of the Mother 3 Project, hinted that Atoy's pitch may have influenced Animal Crossing, which he described as the realization of Atoy's idea. Mother 3 was originally planned for the Super Nintendo, but soon changed course, becoming a 3D Nintendo 64 disk drive game. Several screenshots from this time featured a playable character who looked like Ness, the protagonist of Earthbound, suggesting the game was to have stronger ties with the rest of the Mother series. The rewritable nature of the 64DD software led Miyamoto to consider letting players transfer their art from the Japan-only Mario artist into Mother 3. A toy immediately shot this idea down, as he didn't want to include features just to show off the console's capabilities. After the commercial failure of the 64DD, the game changed course again, aiming for release on the Nintendo 64. Due to the Earthbound team's inexperience with 3D technology, a brand new team was brought in to develop Mother 3. But this team was unfamiliar with the series, and Iwata would often have to give them advice on how to construct gameplay scenarios. Things were made even more difficult by Iwata's absence during development, as he had other commitments in America and Kyoto. The scope of the game was also too large for the team due to the complex interplay between the world and the characters. Some elements were unfeasible with the Nintendo 64's hardware, but the team stubbornly pursued them, inspired by Iwata's words of encouragement. Never say a programmer can't do something. After three console changes and six years in development, Mother 3 was cancelled in August of 2000. In an interview with a toy, Miyamoto and Iwata estimated the game was anywhere between 30 to 60 percent complete when it was cancelled. It was in this same interview that a toy mentioned the possibility of restarting the project on the Game Boy Advance. Producers discouraged him, saying it would be just as much work to make a GBA game as an N64 game. Nevertheless, the project was restarted in 2003 for the Game Boy Advance. A compilation game called Mother 1 Plus 2 was also released as a refresher for the franchise, and a commercial for the game ended with the message confirming Mother 3 was back in development. Atoy did not regret downsizing the game. He felt the final product reflected his vision and was happy they didn't go with the 3D look, as pixel art went hand in hand with the series. Wood and metal were meshed together in Mother 3's logo to reflect the game's themes of inclusiveness. Another reason was to create an uneasy juxtaposition between the natural world and the modern world, a key theme in the game. He would also reflect the game's chimera enemies, which are separate creatures combined into one. A toy compared these creatures to Sid's toys in Toy Story, who were spliced together from different parts. In fact, while the game was in development for the 64DD, a toy considered using Chimera Forest as a subtitle. This was not used in the final release, as the team didn't want to influence how players imagined the world before they played the game. The Majipsy character was created in response to what a toy referred to as the more macho story in Mother 3, which is focused on conflict. The Majipsies, who find themselves in the middle of the conflict, are androgynous and have accepted that they will eventually die. By blending masculine and feminine traits and a refusal of power, the Majipsies balance out the more masculine nature of the story. The Majipsies fit perfectly with the toy's perception of Mother as a more feminine RPG franchise. When one of the Majipsies begins to disappear, they say a phrase which roughly translates to, I'm disappearing for a bit. I'm okay, though. This is a reference to the official slogan a toy wrote for the 1989 film Kiki's Delivery Service, which roughly translates to, I was depressed for a while. I'm okay now. The team joked that they would have refused the reference were it not written by a toy himself. 
The character Duster also has interesting inspirations and was given a limp because of the game's theme of inclusivity. A toy reasoned that handicapped people should be as much a part of the world of Mother 3 as they are a part of ours. In Mother 3, the player saves by talking to save frogs, in contrast with past games in the series where players called their father. This was a decision made with some hesitance, as the team were worried that fans wouldn't like the change. Frogs were specifically chosen because of their peculiar nature. A toy thought that an animal like a dog wouldn't stand out enough to seem important. The decision was also influenced by the song Furi Makeba Kaeru, which translates roughly to, if you turn around, frog. The song was written by a toy and performed by the Japanese pop singer Akiko Yano. The lyrics portray an optimistic frog who, in spite of its own trivial nature, encourages people not to be dejected by their failure. In a similar vein, the game's save frogs are seen after the player dies. There's an incognito Mr. Saturn in the game who, after bidding the player farewell, is revealed to have walked just slightly off-screen. This was originally just a bug, but was kept in the game as the toy found it funny. The area Tane Tane Island was also inspired by American TV series like Lost and Twin Peaks. However, these areas had to be toned down because the toy was made so uneasy by his initial draft. Mother 3's soundtrack was composed by Shogo Sakai after the composers of the first two games were unavailable due to other commitments. The length of Mother 3's soundtrack, which is comprised of 250 songs across six hours of music, needed a composer who could devote their full attention to the project. The composer was also required to be familiar with the game and its themes. Sakai was an obvious choice due to his enthusiasm for the material. The game's main theme, called The Love Theme, was composed very late in development, and didn't even exist in December 2005, four months before the game's release. The Pig Mask Army's theme was to be used in its place up until that point. The team decided that a new theme should be composed because of an unspecified scene of extreme importance, which required a greater emotional impact than the planned composition could provide. Eight Melodies from Earthbound Beginnings became a popular song in Japan, even appearing in elementary school textbooks. As a result, a toy imagined a beginner being able to easily play Mother 3's love theme on piano. To achieve this, he specified that the theme should be easy to both hum and play on piano using only a single finger. Sakai was evidently prepared for such an order, as despite the late request in a toy's stipulation, he was able to produce the love theme almost immediately. The Okiska? sample that plays during both of the game's name selection screens is actually taken from a toy himself. It was recorded without his knowledge by Earthbound composer Hirokazu Tanaka. According to a toy, Tanaka tricked him into saying the phrase, and recorded it with a hidden tape recorder. There are many nods and references to other compositions in Mother 3's soundtrack. The music that plays during Leader's story is called Leader's Gymniopede. The song is not an original composition, but is actually an adaptation of Gymniopede No. 1 by Eric Satie. Additionally, the song Ode to Ancestors, Eighth Movement, is a medley of classical musical pieces, including pieces from Beethoven, Bach, and George Frederick Handel. The intro to Mr. Batty Twist is a reference to the iconic theme music from the 1960s Batman television series. Sixteen Melodies, as the name suggests, contains the melodies from both renditions of eight melodies from Earthbound Beginnings and Earthbound, respectively. The love theme from Mother 3 is also incorporated into the song. Various themes in the game also include the distinctive sliding synth sample featured in Earthbound. And while not a composition, the enemy called Gently Weeping Guitar continues the Mother series' tradition of Beatles references, this time to their song While My Guitar Gently Weeps. As expected from its long development cycle, content was cut from Mother 3. It seems that the player was planned to fight the Green Dragos at some point during the game. In the fight, the Drago refuses to attack the player, instead confiding in you and making you cry. This may suggest that the battle was to have a tragic tone, with the player being forced to fight the Drago against both of their wills. It seems that this battle was also related to the frozen Drago in the Chimera Lab, as the Drago drops the Chimera Lab map once defeated. Many of the bosses have unused battle sprites showing them from behind. In the final game, bosses cannot be approached from behind, meaning that it's impossible to see these sprites. There are also unused animations for the Masked Man, showing him exploding, levitating, firing his arm cannon, and being repaired. Although the Mother series has a cult following in the West, Mother 3 has yet to be officially released outside of Japan. It was, however, unofficially translated by Clyde Tomato Mandolin, a professional games translator who has unofficially translated many Japan-only games such as Bahamut Lagoon and Star Ocean. The translation quickly passed 100,000 downloads upon its release, and Mandolin stresses the translation was done out of love rather than to compete with Nintendo. 
Despite its lack of a Western release, the game was re-released on the Japanese Virtual Console in December of 2015. Rumors arose in February 2016 that the Virtual Console port of Mother 3 would finally be released to Western audiences. The rumors surfaced in the wake of both the Japanese port of Mother 3 and the release of Earthbound Beginnings in 2015, 26 years after the game's release on the Famicom. It has to be noted, however, that while Earthbound Beginnings ROM was completed but never released, no official translation effort has ever been known to exist for Mother 3. As a result, porting Mother 3 to a Western platform would take significantly more work than Earthbound Beginnings did. Shigesato Atoy has denied rumors that Mother 4 is in development. Atoy was inspired to create the series by his young daughter, whom he was unable to see as often as he would have liked due to divorce issues. Now that his daughter has grown up, he feels no more reason to continue creating Mother games. Atoy also compared his experience to that of a pop star who, as a professional, is forced to keep making albums even if they've run out of ideas. Atoy said he was relieved making games was not his job. If it were, he would have to keep making sequels for more cynical reasons. Atoy comically said, Doing things like that for fun has ended for me. If I were to try to do it now, it would be something I'd had to force. That would be awful for my sphincter. Did you know? Prior to working on the Golden Sun series, developer Camelot made several other RPGs. Most famously, they heavily impacted the Shining Force series. Camelot would go on to develop another RPG called Beyond the Beyond for the original PlayStation. While it was notable at the time for being the first traditional Japanese RPG available for the PS1 in the West, it was widely panned upon release. Reviewers criticized the game's length, pacing, difficulty, and overabundance of random encounters. Despite this, Beyond the Beyond was something of a spiritual predecessor to Golden Sun. Several features that made Golden Sun a rousing success, such as its combat and the pseudo-3D battle screens, made their first appearance in Beyond the Beyond. Golden Sun had a very long development cycle for a Game Boy Advance title, being in production for almost 18 months. By comparison, handheld games at the time were generally expected to be completed in under a year. The extended length of the project was mostly due to Golden Sun and its sequel, The Lost Age, originally being planned as one game. It was ultimately split into two installments because the combined size would have been too big for a single Game Boy Advance cartridge to hold. In order to justify splitting the story in half, The Lost Age was made to follow characters who were the antagonists in the first game. Game, a concept the studio had utilized before. In an interview on Nintendo World Report, Hiroyuki Takahashi and his brother, Shugo Takahashi, stated, Originally we had made a game called Shining Force 3, and it was popular here in the United States. In that game you had the ability to play as both good side and the bad side, and that seemed to be a really nice way for the players to understand the entire setting and a good way to convey information and story. And so when we were doing Golden Sun, we again thought, well, we could expand upon that. Golden Sun's initial design documents outlined it as a Nintendo 64 game. Development started very late in the N64's life cycle, however, and the project was moved over to the Game Boy Advance. This actually helped the game in the end, as it released very early in the Game Boy Advance's life and became the first major RPG hit on the system. Conversely, the third game in the series, Dark Dawn, was released late in the DS's life, seven years after the release of The Lost Age. The long wait for a sequel was a source of much frustration for fans, even prompting some to make hoaxes of a potential third installment. The most circulated of these was called Golden Sun, the Solar Soothsayer. According to an online post, the Solar Soothsayer was a DS game announced at a small pre-E3 event complete with screenshots supposedly taken on a cell phone. The rumor ran rampant for some time, but the screenshots were eventually proven false as they reused promotional artwork for the Lost Age. The creator of the hoax, a forum user who went by the name Opium, later came forward and explained that he'd created the hoax to generate a discussion about a new Golden Sun game. While Hiroyuki Takahashi Takahashi learned about the hoax during an interview with Engadget. He was enthusiastic about it, remarking, The Solar Soothsayer sounds really cool. I wonder how the story would go. I want to see how it would turn out. Even though Dark Dawn took seven years to come out, Camelot intended to work on a third Golden Sun shortly after the Lost Age. The project had to be put on hold, as the team were busy working on the Mario Tennis and Mario Golf games. After this, several employees left Camelot, and the Takahashi brothers thought their new staff weren't ready to tackle development of such a large-scale game. In an interview posted on Camelot's Japanese website, Hiroyuki Takahashi said the idea to make a new Golden Sun game for the DS came to him after drinking a lot of liquor at a party. Since Dark Dawn was being made for the DS, 
NES, the team naturally wanted to take advantage of the system's features and toyed with the idea of playing the game using only the touchscreen. Golden Sun featured a system that allowed players to carry over their save data into the Lost Age, either by way of a 260 character password or by using the Game Link cable. To many players' dismay, Dark Dawn didn't include any kind of data transfer system. According to Takahashi, they decided not to include it because Dark Dawn took place 30 years after the Lost Age, so there wouldn't have been much benefit to transferring the save data anyway. There are some interesting unused assets and secrets in the Golden Sun series. Hidden in the code for the first two games is an alternate character portrait for Alex. What's interesting is that the image is located in the same area reserved for the portraits of playable characters, suggesting Alex was intended to join the player's party at some point. There's also an unused NPC sprite for the character resembling Link from The Legend of Zelda in the data for The Lost Age. The sprite's intended purpose is unknown, but it's thought to be simply a nod to the Zelda franchise. When starting a new file in the original Golden Sun, the player will be given the option to change the name of Isaac, the main character. If the select button is pressed three times on the name input screen, the player will also be given the option to rename the other party members, Garrett, Ivan, and Mia. On Mia's name input screen, if the player presses up, down, up, down, left, right, left, right, up, right, down, left, up, then select, they can also change the names of Jenna, Felix, and Sheba. It's also possible to get a secret bad ending in the first game. Early on, the great healer will ask the player if they will accept responsibility for the fate of the land. If the player answers no and leaves the room, the screen will turn gray and a message will appear saying, and so the world began drifting toward its fated destruction. The TV commercial for the first Golden Sun is famous for having absolutely nothing to do with the game. Dark Dawn referenced this by including the chandelier dragon from the commercial as a new summon. Camelot also referenced some of their older games. In the Lost Age, there's an injured shopkeeper behind the item shop in Madra. Casting Mind Read on her triggers the text, Eyes, Shining in the Darkness. No, go away. Shining in the Darkness is the first title developed by Camelot in the first entry in the Shining Force series. Shining Force featured the character Dark Soul as the game's antagonist. In the Lost Age, the final boss, Doom Dragon, has an attack named Dark Soul Grasp. The future of Golden Sun is uncertain, and Hiroyuki Takahashi said that whether Camelot makes a fourth game depends on how much fan demand there is. Did you know? Advance Wars is actually the fifth entry in a series generally referred to as Nintendo Wars. The first game in the series was Famicom Wars, followed by Game Boy Wars 1, 2, and 3, as well as Super Famicom Wars. A faster-paced Turbo edition of Game Boy Wars was also made with more levels, though this is largely considered the same game. Although the Wars series had stayed in Japan up to this point, Advance Wars was lucky to see a release in Japan at all. The game was one of several projects Nintendo made as part of their lineup of launch titles for the Game Boy Advance, but they were stretching themselves thin. In order to help alleviate their workload, Nintendo asked Intelligent Systems to aid with development of Advance Wars. At the time, the team was told that turn-based games weren't popular outside of Japan due to their complicated nature. Early on, members of Intelligent Systems would get together and discuss new ideas for the game, but these ideas were almost always shot down by Nintendo for being too sophisticated and unsuitable for a casual audience. In response, the team worked to make the title simpler and easier to understand. One way they did this was by adding a detailed tutorial so players wouldn't have to read the game manual before playing. Members of the team also incorporated elements from their own favorite game genres into Advance Wars. For example, the precision of movement when controlling units was inspired by shooter games, and rhythm games like Beat Mania helped to add a rhythm to the way the game is played. When Nintendo of America's marketing team got a chance to try Advance Wars, they loved it and decided the game was suitable for a full international release. The game received critical acclaim in North America and may have helped change Nintendo's view of the Western market. Kentaro Nishimura, one of the game's designers, cited the success of Advance Wars as a key reason why Nintendo eventually released Fire Emblem outside of Japan. Since the games had a similar playstyle, Nintendo thought the American Game Boy Advance audience had been primed for Fire Emblem. This seems fitting, as Fire Emblem only exists at all thanks to the original Famicom Wars, with the first Fire Emblem using the Famicom Wars engine. Advance Wars was launched in North America first, with releases planned for Japan and Europe shortly after. Ironically, despite originally being planned as a Japan-only title, Advance Wars actually ended up being cancelled in Japan. 
One explanation for this is that the game's original Japanese release date was October 12, 2001, just one month after the September 11th terrorist attacks in the United States. An alternate theory is that the game was pushed back due to the release of Game Boy Wars 3, which came out in August of 2001. It's possible Nintendo didn't want their own games competing with each other, and delayed Advance Wars to give Game Boy Wars 3 a fighting chance. Due to Advance Wars being cancelled, the game's sequel, Advance Wars 2 Black Hole Rising, was also cancelled in Japan despite both games being developed in the country. The games finally saw a Japanese release in the form of a 2-in-1 compilation cartridge in 2004, prior to the release of Advance Wars Dual Strike on the Nintendo DS. However, cancellations would continue to plague the series in Japan. The next installment, Advance Wars Days of Ruin, was released internationally in 2008, but was ultimately cancelled in Japan following a series of delays. Interestingly, the international versions of Days of Ruin contain a full Japanese translation in their data, though it's only available through hacking. This seems to indicate that the Japanese version of the game was fully completed and ready for release well before it was cancelled. Days of Ruin would eventually become available in Japan in 2013 as a downloadable title for members of the Club Nintendo Reward Program. Although many Advance Wars titles released in Japan after the West, the Japanese game seems to serve as the base for all titles. After both versions of Advance Wars released, gamers saw several notable differences between the two versions. Most of the game's commanding officers had their names changed in the West, and some were even given redesigns. Nell was originally named Catherine and wore a sleeveless top with a shorter skirt. Drake was named Mop and seemed more like a traditional pirate. Sanja, originally called Asuka, wore glasses instead of a hat, and her uniform was changed from red to green, and Grit was called Billy and wore a cowboy hat. The most drastic changes were made to Olaf, who was originally named Whip, and had a white beard and a Santa hat, and Kanbei, who was called Kikuchio and wore samurai armor in the Japanese game. Other differences from the Japanese version include the term Shogun being changed to Commanding Officer, and the Red Star Army being renamed to Orange Star. This subtle change in color was possibly to avoid direct comparisons to communist regimes. In Advance Wars 2, many of the visual changes to commanding officers were at least partially incorporated into the Japanese designs, leading to fewer differences between officers in both releases. In Japan, Advance Wars 1 and 2 are known as Game Boy Wars Advance 1 and 2. Although the Advance Wars name was kept for the DS games Dual Strike and Days of Ruin in the West, both titles adopted the leading title Famicom Wars DS in Japan. Days of Ruin had a notable tonal shift for the series, having a somewhat more realistic and gritty art style. According to one of the game's English localizers, Tim O'Leary, the change was made due to some fans saying the series was becoming repetitive and predictable. Interestingly, the shift was also influenced by sales data. Although it began as a Japan-only franchise, Advance Wars had become much more popular in North America than in Japan. As such, Intelligent Systems altered the game's tone in an attempt to cater to Westerners. Intelligent Systems also felt that the new style fit better with Days of Ruins near future sci-fi setting. There are several unique secrets and easter eggs hidden in the Advance Wars series. In the first game's tutorial level, Copter Tactics, the player is instructed to win by capturing the enemy's headquarters. If the player instead wins by routing the enemy, it triggers an alternate dialogue from Nell where she congratulates the player for their work. Conversely, in the first tutorial level of Advance Wars 2, if the player somehow manages to run out of fuel, Nell will scold Andy for goofing around and tell him to forfeit the level. In the map editor mode of Advance Wars 2, if the player repeatedly attempts to place a unit on an illegal square at least 50 times in a row, it'll cause Nell to interject with a snarky comment, saying, You must really like doing that over and over again. Keep it up. If the player holds down the L and R buttons while selecting the map editor, the game will load a special bonus map that spells out Nintendo in kanji. This same map appears in both Advance Wars 1 and 2. Dual Strike also includes a new bonus map featuring the name of the series itself, which was even translated for the English release. Another interesting fact about Advance Wars is that practically all of the weapons and vehicles in the game are based on real devices. For example, the Orange Star mechanized infantry is inspired by the American M20A1 slash A1B1 Super Bazooka, and the Blue Moon mech unit is based on the Russian RPG-7 rocket launcher. The Orange Star fighter jets also resemble the American F-15 Eagle, while the Blue Moon jet seems to be based on the French Dassault Mirage 3. 
The original Advance Wars also contains a bizarre glitch involving the map editor. To trigger the glitch, the player must first play the level Naval Forces and lose by allowing the enemy to destroy their T-Copter, then go to the map editor. By placing one unit and then deleting it, the game will respond as though the player's forces have been wiped out. If the player then exits the editor using the in-game menu rather than the map editor menu, the map editor's features will be available to use anywhere in the game. This glitch has several practical applications. First and foremost, it can be used to delete enemy units during a normal level, allowing the player to easily bypass any mission in the game. Additionally, the glitch can also be used to save the campaign maps as custom maps, which allows the player to use custom maps that are smaller than the default size of 30 by 20 tiles. The War series was also planned to appear on the Nintendo 64. In 1999, Nintendo announced a new entry in the series to be released for the Nintendo 64, dubbed 64 Wars or Advance War 64 by fans. The game was being developed by Hudson Soft rather than series creators Intelligent Systems. Hudson likely got this opportunity because of their work on Game Boy Wars Turbo and Game Boy Wars 2. Much like previous titles, the gameplay of 64 Wars would involve players controlling units on a 2D grid. However, the game would transition to 3D graphics to illustrate key moments in battle, as well as combat between units. 64 Wars was also going to feature connectivity with Game Boy Wars 2 via the Nintendo 64 Transfer Pack. According to promotional material, players could start playing a level on their Nintendo 64 and then transfer the game to their Game Boy to continue playing on the go. They could even transfer it back to the N64 to finish the level. Sadly, 64 Wars was a short-lived project and was only ever shown in a few magazine ads and previewed at Nintendo's Space World event in 1999. No reason was given for the game's cancellation, but Hudson did go on to make a third Game Boy Wars game. The series would eventually make it to the GameCube in the form of Battalion Wars 1 and 2. Although these entries have completely different gameplay and are considered a sub-series, they were originally announced under the title Advance Wars Under Fire and are known as Assault Famicom Wars vs. in Japan. The Advance Wars name was dropped in the West so that players didn't expect the game to play like a typical Wars game. Did you know? Many Game Boy Advance games were censored, including high-profile releases such as Mario Kart Super Circuit. Parts of the Japanese game were deemed insensitive by some, mainly due to the Shy Guys in the Sunset Wilds course wearing Native American war bonnets. Art for the Shy Guys was altered in the international release to remove the bonnets, likely due to the cultural sensitivity concerns among North American staff. This affected the course preview image as well as the Shy Guys themselves. Although the headdresses were removed, Native American teepees can still be seen in both the preview image and the course's background in the international release. Surprisingly, this wasn't the only Native American-related censorship in a racing game produced by Nintendo for the Game Boy Advance. F-Zero Maximum Velocity had several playable characters, including Nietzsche, a young Native American man who pilots the Windwalker. In the Japanese game, however, his vehicle was named Crazy Horse. This was a reference to the man of the same name, a war leader for the Lakota tribe in the 19th century. Crazy Horse took up arms against the United States in several battles resulting in Native American victory, earning him notoriety. The name was likely changed once again due to concerns of cultural insensitivity by Nintendo's staff in North America. The ending of Maximum Velocity was also slightly censored, but for different reasons. In the Western release, the outfits for Jane B. Christie and Kamiko were modified to show slightly less skin. Another bit of censored content can be found in Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure. The game has a couple interesting localization differences between the European and American releases, with the EU version being closer to the original Japanese game. In the original game, when Shinron offers Pilaf any wish, Oolong will barge in and ask for some girl's panties. However, this was censored in the American version, where Oolong instead demands that Shinron give him the world's most comfortable pair of underwear. The underwear in question was also altered to look a bit more masculine in the North American release. Capcom's Mega Man Zero series was also censored outside of Japan. Defeating an enemy with a non-buster weapon in the Japanese version of the games would make robot enemies spill a kind of oil that looks like blood. This blood-like oil effect was removed in the North American and European versions of the games, either to avoid controversy or to ensure an E rating. This oil was also splashed heavily on the walls of the robot disposal sensor in the Japanese version of Mega Man Zero, but in the international release, the walls are clean. Interestingly, the Japanese games already had a suitable for everyone regardless of age rating with the oil. Ports of both Doom and Doom 2 were censored on the GBA as well. 
In the original Doom, blood has been recolored to green and gore has been toned down in general. In the PC version of Doom, enemies hit with heavy artillery like rocket launchers often burst with blood splatter effects. In the GBA version, however, the hostiles do not burst. Instead, their regular death animation plays. In most versions of Doom, there are mutilated bodies placed throughout the game. In the GBA version, these bodies have either been colored green or replaced by a green pool of blood. Like Doom 1 on the GBA, the blood in Doom 2 is green instead of red, and blood splatter effects are reduced. One difference, however, is that mutilated bodies were removed outright in Doom 2. The health meter was also censored to remove blood when the player is heavily damaged. This wasn't the only way the games were censored. In Doom 1's E1M4 command control, there's a room about halfway through the level with an elevated platform in the middle. In the original 1.0 release of Doom on PC, this platform was shaped like a swastika. This was altered in later versions, including the GBA port, where two of the symbol's arms were removed. Doom 2 was altered in a similar fashion. The game's Wolfenstein 3D bonus levels were edited to cover up any offensive iconography, and a painting of Hitler was replaced by a painting of Wilhelm Strasse from Return to Castle Wolfenstein. Another retro title with a Game Boy Advance port is Super Ghouls and Ghosts. The game was censored internationally, with regional differences in both the Super Nintendo and GBA releases. Super Ghouls and Ghosts' final boss, Sardius, is named Samuel in the Japanese GBA release. In Hebrew, Samuel means Venom of God or Poison of God, and in Jewish lore, Samuel is the Archangel of Death. The name was changed when the Super Nintendo version was brought to the West, likely to Nintendo's anti-religious reference policy that was enforced throughout the 90s. The same goes for the game's graphical changes, such as crosses being replaced with Ox. However, it is curious why these regional changes carried over to the Game Boy Advance game in both regions, considering Nintendo's far more relaxed stance on religious material in the 2000s. A major selling point of the Game Boy Advance was its backward compatibility with original Game Boy and Game Boy Color games, but this feature wasn't exactly perfect. Due to different audio hardware between the Color and the GBA, some games would experience musical glitches. One game, a music creation software called Pocket Music, didn't work on the GBA at all due to these hardware differences. That said, a fully functioning GBA version was later released. The only other Game Boy game known to be incompatible with the Advance was Chi-Chi Alien, developed by Pokemon series collaborator Creatures Inc. Its incompatibility stemmed from its gameplay relying heavily on the Game Boy Color's infrared sensor. Later on, the GBA Micro would do away with the backwards compatibility altogether in favor of a smaller design, a brighter backlit screen, and customizable faceplates that were only available in Japan and North America. Despite the Micro's upgrades, the device failed to meet Nintendo's sales expectations, selling only 2.5 million units worldwide, one of the worst ever sales records for a gaming handheld. Satoru Iwata, Nintendo's president at the time, admitted the Micro was a failure and attributed its lack of sales to a poor marketing campaign that was overshadowed by the much more popular DS. The GBA also had some interesting add-ons. One of the first was the e-reader, a peripheral that let players scan special cards to play games or unlock hidden content in other titles. It was released in Japan in December 2001, less than a year after the launch of the GBA, and would release in North America and Australia, but not Europe. Although the e-reader failed to find success in most of the world, it was a financial success in Japan and was supported throughout the GBA's life. This resulted in some cards only being released in Japan, including sets based on Mega Man.exe, F-Zero GP Legend, Mario vs. Donkey Kong, and Pikmin 2. For games that were released internationally but had Japan-exclusive e-reader support, the games were usually tweaked so any additional features normally unlocked by the e-reader were readily available. However, this wasn't always the case. While Mario vs. Donkey Kong had secret levels that could only be unlocked with e-reader cards, just 1,000 packs of 5 cards were made. They were given away as part of a competition held by Korokoro Magazine in Japan, with a 6 card available at the 2004 Next Generation World Hobby Fair, making this series of cards extremely rare. Each card unlocked a single level in the game, though there are actually 12 levels hidden in the game's code, meaning 6 of these levels went completely unused. There are also secret levels in the North American version of the game, but without e-reader support, they're rendered inaccessible unless players resort to hacking. Given the e-reader's lack of success in the West, it's no surprise some of the cards have become valuable since their release. The Super Mario Advance 4 e-reader series included a total of 43 cards that could be used to unlock special power-ups, bonus levels, and other gameplay features. Five of these cards were available exclusively through Walmart in the US, but because the e-reader was discontinued shortly after their release, these cards ended up becoming particularly rare. Complete sets of all the cards can sell online for as much as $60. 
Another valuable e-reader card is the Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire Eon Ticket card, which could be used to obtain the legendary Pokemon Latios and Latias and copies of Ruby or Sapphire. The card was given away as a promotional item at E3 2003, as well as in the September 2003 issue of Nintendo Power and at participating Toys R Us stores. The E3 2003 version of this card, which came in special packaging, has become a collector's item and sells for over $100 on its own. The rarest of all e-reader card packs, however, is the E3 2002 pack. It was a promotional gift that included four cards, two Pokemon TCG cards with Japanese backs, a unique version of the Game & Watch Manhole card with different art, and a special Kirby card that was used as part of a contest. Expo attendees could scan the card, which would then tell them if they'd won a prize or not. Of the four, the Kirby card is the rarest since most were simply disposed of after being used, and complete sets can sell for as much as $300. Another interesting fact about the e-reader is that some cards contain a tune that's usually hidden. Totaka's song is a simple 19-note melody that sound designer Kazumi Totaka hides in projects he's worked on. Cards P13 and P15 for the Japanese release Animal Crossing E contain the minigame Who's Done It, which has Totaka's song as the background music. This is unusual, as the song is usually hidden within a game rather than being blatantly on show. Another officially made peripheral for the Game Boy Advance was the Play Yan. First released in February 2005, the Play Yan was a media player designed for use with the Nintendo DS and GBA. By loading music onto an SD card and inserting it into the Play Yan cartridge, the GBA could be used as an MP3 player or even a video player. Nintendo also made several minigames available on their Japanese website that could be downloaded and played on the Play Yan. Because of its power consumption, the play in was not meant for use with the original Game Boy Advance, but was compatible with the SP. Although the SP lacked a traditional headphone jack, the play in cartridge came with one built in. One of the most unusual peripherals for the Game Boy Advance was the iCard Pro, released in 2004 by Biondo Racing Products. It was essentially a radio receiver that displayed information about auto racing events on the Game Boy's screen when used at select locations that supported the iCard service. The information could include everything from race results and lap times to individual driver profiles and allowed for two different feeds to be followed at the same time. In this episode, we're going to be looking at some trivia from titles released on Nintendo's Game Boy Advance. Nintendo's grip on the portable gaming world has always been strong. It's perhaps one of their most revered ventures by fans and critics. After the Game Boy and Game Boy Color came the Game Boy Advance, a portable with very little competition in the West with specs comparable to that of the Super Nintendo. The best-selling trio of games on the system were Pokemon Ruby, Sapphire, and Emerald versions, which saw several revisions and were even remade on the 3DS. Games are usually tweaked and reprinted shortly after they're released, as a large audience of players encounter bugs that the comparatively small development team never found. These revised builds usually have a number that indicates their version, such as version 1.1, 1.2, etc. Pokemon Ruby and Sapphire's version 1.1 release had several changes, but not all of these changes fixed bugs. Humorously, the English localizers happened to misspell the names of multiple Pokemon in the original release, which were fixed in 1.1. The item description for the Togepi doll misspelt its name as Topgepi, and Mawile's Pokedex entry in Ruby spelt his name as Mahwile. You're saying it weird. Why are you putting so much emphasis on the H? Speaking of differences, Pokemon Emerald version had several pieces of exclusive content, including the elusive Mirage Tower. This tower, or at the very least its English name, may be a reference to a tower with the same name from Final Fantasy. Both Mirage Towers appear in a desert and only appear under certain circumstances. They both also contain a spiral-shaped dungeon within them. Some other GBA games were considered hits even though they didn't sell nearly as much as Pokemon. The best-selling game on the system that didn't have Pokemon in its name was Mario Kart Super Circuit, which had a rather extensive amount of unused content. The game has all four of Super Mario Kart's battle stages within its data, completely unused. Since tracks from Super Mario Kart can be unlocked for regular kart races, it's speculated that these battle tracks were planned to be unlockable at some point during development. The game also has several unused items, some of which have some functionality when hacked back into the game. There's an unused fake item box which places a banana behind the cart. There's also a gold mushroom which has the same functionality as in later Mario Kart games, and an infinite mushroom which never runs out of boosts. There are triple bananas as well, but these have no programming attached to them. 
A Pabam icon also exists in the game's data, but it's unclear whether these would have been items like in Mario Kart Double Dash, or if they'd represent the player as a Pabam in battle mode like in Mario Kart 64. Hidden content can be found in other GBA games as well, such as in the data of F1 2002. Looking through the data, a number of standard JPEG format images can be unearthed in both the NTSC and PAL releases of the title. These files are mostly made up of photographs, though one of them shows a CG dinosaur. It's possible that these were included by the game's developers to use up excess storage space on the cartridge. In the Japanese version of Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, Boomerang Bros can drop an item called Oho Gear once they're defeated. This item raises the player's defense by 28 points and can be equipped by either Mario or Luigi. For unknown reasons, it was removed from all international ports of the game. The item can still be found in the game's data in the English game, however, and can be used through hacking or cheat devices. The item is fully functional in all versions, and its description was translated into multiple languages. This seems to indicate that the Oho Gear was originally meant to be in the game's international releases, but was disabled late in its development. The reason for this remains unknown. Developers sometimes want to incorporate their history into a game, as can be seen with Maya the Bee The Great Adventure. Normally, booting the game will run through the developer's credits, such as the Shinen logo. By holding both of the system's shoulder buttons during this sequence, the Shinen logo will actually change to Abyss instead, and the game's credits will instead use the developer's pseudonyms. This is because the company Shinen is actually made up of members from the demo group Abyss, a prominent team from the demo scene during the days of the Amiga. Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories saw the series' first venture onto Nintendo hardware, but it initially had a different name. Tetsuya Nomura stated in the Kingdom Hearts Ultimania book for the title that the game was originally called Kingdom Hearts Lost Memories. This seems fitting for a game about Sora trying to recover his memories of the past events from the first entry in the series. It would have also been fitting to have Deep Jungle, the Tarzan-themed world from the first game, make a reappearance, though it does not. The reason for Deep Jungle's omission from the title was due to copyright. Both Square Enix and Disney were unable to get the rights to use the franchise's concept and characters from the estate of Edgar Rice Burroughs. Another game which struggled from copyright issues was It's Mr. Pants. Many will be unaware of Mr. Pants' history, being a joke mascot created by Rare staff member Lee Loveday with MS Paint. He was fleshed out after becoming popular with fans of the company, before he finally made his video game debut on the Game Boy Advance in 2004. However, this game wasn't always intended to be a Mr. Pants game, and was initially a Donkey Kong title called Coconut Crackers, featuring Donkey Kong characters, locations, and items. Before landing on Coconut Crackers, they even considered calling the game Splodge, Nutcracker, Animal Crackers, and Sunflower. During development, the game could have been played in both 2D and 3D, a feature removed due to issues with the consistency across both views. Eventually, the Donkey Kong license was dropped due to Microsoft's acquisition of Rare in 2002, before THQ picked up the title and replaced Donkey Kong with Mr. Pants and his family. To keep the game's graphics true to its childish art style origins, the game's artists would create graphics using their less dominant hand. It's Mr. Pants was also planned for release, alongside other Microsoft titles, for the Gizmondo handheld, though it was later cancelled due to the Gizmondo being a commercial failure. Speaking of undergarments, Dragon Ball Advanced Adventure has a couple of interesting localization differences between the European and American releases. The American version has a spelling mistake as well. In the level Land of Corin, after catching him ten times over, Corin will say that Goku's power has increased several times over. Mega Man Battle Network took the Mega Man series to the Game Boy Advance with its own new spin-off series of RPG titles, and makes reference to Pokémon. In Yai's house, a yellow rug can be found in her living room, similar in appearance to a skinned Pikachu from Pokémon. Also in the game, outside the Dentown movie theater, is a movie poster for Upgrade Impossible 3, featuring Rom Cruise, a clear parody of the movie Mission Impossible 3 and its lead actor Tom Cruise. Another popular RPG on the Game Boy Advance was Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. In the game's introduction, the player encounters three schoolyard bullies, Guinness, Colin, and Lyle. After the battle, the player is warped to the magical world of Ivalice. Morbidly, much later in the game, a mission will become available which involves saving a professor from three zombies, each with the same names as these children. 
Harvest Moon, more friends of Mineral Town, has a bizarre easter egg based around fan speculation. If the player goes to sleep at 9pm on the 30th day of winter, there is a chance they will be shown a dream sequence featuring both the female playable character and the mayor of the town, Mayor Thomas. The two will appear to be getting married, only for the player to wake up confused. So confused, in fact, that she will even forget how the word dream is spelled. An obvious mistake by the developers. Pushing a console to its limits is something many game developers strive to do. With the Game Boy Advance being a primarily 2D gaming handheld, the desire to push the device and create 3D games was an understandable one. Raylight Games, an Italian studio, was one of the more prominent 3D developers for the GBA, and created their own 3D engine for the handheld with impressive results. They created two demos showing the rendering capabilities of their Blue Roses engine, one by recreating a similar area to the hangar from Metal Gear Solid, and another of a playable demo for Resident Evil 2. This Resident Evil demo put players in control of Leon during the opening moments of the full original PlayStation release. The demo also includes a small, non-playable snippet showing a shot from Street Fighter X after completion. While none of the games were finished or officially endorsed by their original rights holders, these demos were created to show off the light footprint and power of Raylight's Blue Roses engine. Raylight tried to pitch the game to Capcom officially, but it was turned down, in part because the Game Boy Advance was ending its relevancy, but also because Capcom saw issue with a mature game for the system. Nintendo is praised for the many different genres in which it's willing to feature its eponymous Mario. Not only has Mario starred in a variety of popular games ranging from platformers, sports games and educational titles, to puzzle games, shooters, and fighting games. One of the most popular being the variety of Mario RPGs. Fans of Super Mario RPG, developed by Squaresoft for the SNES and published by Nintendo in 1996, had to wait some time for a new Mario RPG title. The next RPG focusing on the mustachioed pipe fitter was Paper Mario in the year 2000, having Mario take on a new form and appearance. The next RPG which concentrated on the classic form of the character would be Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga in 2003, often considered the true successor to Square's earlier take on a Mario RPG. However, prior to Superstar Saga's release, developers Alpha Dream had created another game which perhaps acted as the catalyst to Mario's return to the role-playing realm of turn-based mechanics. That game, which was aimed primarily at a younger audience, is Tomato Adventure. Tomato Adventure was developed by Alpha Dream and published by Nintendo in early 2002 for the Game Boy Advance, exclusively to a Japanese audience. The player takes on the role of Demil, an anthropomorphic hair-like character. The game's setting is a land known as the Ketchup Kingdom, under the reign of the Tomato fanatic ruler King Abira. Demil has been shunned from society and banished to spend his days in the cliffside Kobori village being exiled, as with the rest of the villagers, because of their distaste for tomatoes. When the national holiday Tomato Day rolls around, Demil is watching TV when an announcement is made, revealing that a machine has been completed called the Supercara Cooker. According to King Abira, this machine would allow for the citizens of the Ketchup Kingdom to remain as children forever. As Tomato Day is a special occasion, Demil is given the opportunity to fight for the chance to leave the village in which he has been confined, just for the day. After winning this right, he explores the nearby toy ruins with his girlfriend Passaran. During their tour of the ruins, the couple are kidnapped by two purple creatures called Boriki and Goriki, who escape in an airship. They drop Demil out of the ship, setting his adventure in motion as he sallies forth to rescue his girlfriend. Passaran is taken to the Gimmick Palace, where King Abira reveals his plans to use her energy to charge the Supercara Cooker. Not only that, but it's revealed that the Supercara Cooker is not a machine intended to keep the entire kingdom young, but instead it will be used to turn the inhabitants into toys. Demil must adventure through the world, taking out the six Super Kids, collecting six toy parts along the way to grant him access to the Gimmick Palace, so that he can save his girlfriend, prevent the Supercara Cooker from being activated, and defeat the king. On his quest to save the Tomato Village, Demil is joined by other characters who assist him on his journey. They must battle with enemies using a variety of toy-like weapons called gimmicks. Each gimmick attack is unique in how it's carried out, similar to the special bros attacks within Mario & Luigi. These fall into four categories. 
time gimmicks requiring the player to press a button with the correct timing, render gimmicks involving hitting the same button multiple times, speed gimmicks having to tap a series of buttons quickly, and Doki Doki gimmicks, which are unique in execution. These different forms of attack contribute to the game's active participation during battles, where unlike most traditional RPGs before it, the player would simply choose to attack and it would be executed automatically without player input. Each character can have four gimmicks selected for use within battle, with each having a limited number of uses. After all uses of these attacks are depleted, they will all be replenished. Each gimmick can also be adjusted to the player's preference. Individually, gimmicks can be given their own difficulty setting, changing the weapon's damage the higher the difficulty. As you would expect, the higher the difficulty, the harder it is to successfully perform the attack. The player is even able to test how the difficulty will change the attack from their inventory screen. Failing to successfully pull off a gimmick attack will still hit the enemy, however. Gimmicks can also be upgraded with batteries found throughout the journey. After successfully executing gimmick attacks, the player is rewarded a number of stars depending on the gimmick's difficulty setting, contributing to their cool meter, though failing an attack will completely deplete the bar. By filling a certain amount of this bar, a gear will be activated which can be spent executing a cool attack, effectively a team attack which will change depending on which partner is in battle with Demille. The player will obtain not just a variety of different gimmicks on their adventure, but a large array of usable items, as well as gear which can be purchased and equipped. To create new gimmicks, the player has to find hidden items called pacifiers. These can be found while walking around the game's maps, hidden in a variety of places. While individual weapons can be upgraded, and gear can be equipped to bolster a character's stats, experience is also earned for each character, and they are capable of leveling. During exploration of the game's maps, there's also the possibility of coming across interactive objects, adding more gameplay to the usually minimally participatory portions of RPGs. These include things like timing button presses for jumps, or simply holding a button to make platforms move. Partway through the adventure, a card-based minigame is unlocked called Gimmicka. After unlocking this minigame, it's possible to duel with or obtain new cards from several characters throughout the player's journey. The objective of the game is to reduce your opponent's health below your own, or to zero. There are two types of card. Gimmick cards, based on the various gimmick weapons in the game, used to attack an opponent. These are automatically put on the table and given a rank based on a color seen in the middle of the screen. A higher ranking card will win a round, though green will always beat blue. After gimmick cards are put into play, the player must select a character card from their hand. These cards change the gimmick's stats, such as increasing or decreasing a rank, or changing the attack value. The difference between the attack stat of the two gimmicks in play will be the damage dealt to the losing player of the round. If both cards remain on the same rank, the higher value attack gimmick is deemed the winner of the round. After all of the player's cards in their hand are used, or one player hits zero health, the game is over. Tomato Adventure was the second title to come from the Alpha Dream Studio, being released after Koto Battle Tengai no Mori Bito for the Game Boy Color. Nintendo approached the team wanting them to develop a new role-playing game under the title Gimmick Land, named after the concept of the game's utilization of gimmicky toys to not just have a game based around turn-based RPG mechanics, but also to introduce more active participation from the player in battle. During this phase of development, the game was being produced for the Game Boy Color, and had made significant progress. Only two screenshots are known to exist from the game's earlier Gimmick Land period, though the title was allegedly close to completion and was almost ready for release. That was until Nintendo released the Game Boy Advance. As the gaming community interest shifted away from the Game Boy Color to the new system, the team was requested by Nintendo to redevelop their game and rename it Tomato Adventure. They had also been instructed to not just rework the quality of the game's visuals and audio, but also introduce a character which would not just reflect the game, but also be easily recognizable and easier to market. In an interview, while discussing how Tomato Adventure came to fruition, Chihiro Fujioka, the game's director, was initially worried about the shift to the new system. However, he also considered this a potential spot of luck, as having a product published on newly released hardware is a good business opportunity. It was also revealed that Gimmicka, the card-based minigame, was created so that the team could test the Game Boy Color's communication features. Originally, players would obtain cards dropped within the world, but Nintendo suggested that this be changed to having the cards be obtained from defeating key characters instead. With the minigame proving to be popular among game testers at Nintendo, 
This portion of the game was expanded, resulting in shortened dialogue from NPCs to save storage space on the cartridge, allowing the introduction of more diverse elements to Gimmicka. Demille proved to be a popular character within Nintendo, with many making assumptions that he would be a surefire inclusion into the Super Smash Bros. series with the release of Brawl on the Wii in 2008. Masahiro Sakurai, the director of Super Smash Bros., had included Demille twice within polls, asking players who they would like to see added to the game. Despite his double inclusion, he has never made a playable appearance outside of the initial release of Tomato Adventure, though much later he would appear as a spirit within Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. To promote the game's release, Nintendo announced a contest which would see gamers enter a draw for a kilo of famed sweet tomatoes from the Kochi Virtue Valley area of Japan. Superstar Saga actually includes two unused musical tracks within its data. which are clearly based upon Tomato Adventure's title music. One of the title's bosses is also incredibly reminiscent of the Yodotsuri enemies found within the sunken ship of Tomato Adventure. Alpha Dream was formed by Chihiro Fujioka in the year 2000 after his departure from Squaresoft. During his tenure with Square, Fujioka worked as the director for Super Mario RPG, his most prominent role within the studio and thus it is fitting that he would be in charge of Mario's continued ventures into the realm of RPGs. Tomato Adventure proved incredibly popular with not just Japanese audiences and critics, but also the team at Nintendo. After gauging the public's response to the game, Nintendo provided Alpha Dream with the rights to develop their own Mario game, which was soon fleshed out into Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga. Superstar Saga has an incredibly strong resemblance to Tomato Adventure, though one major difference between the two was Mario & Luigi's release outside of Japan, plus its incredible popularity, resulting in four sequels. The game was at some point set for release within countries other than Japan. In 2019, a prototype ROM was published online which revealed a Chinese localization had been worked on for release on the iQ system, China's alternative to the Game Boy Advance. This ROM was based on a cartridge which had been sent to the Chinese government for review at a time when the country held a strict ban on video games. For more information on that, check out the Digino Gaming video on gaming within China. While Tomato Adventure never saw localization in the West, Clyde Tomato Mandolin created a set of tools to work on translation efforts for the title, alongside his own translation of the game's items, enemies, attacks, and menus. Some of the game's early dialogue has also been translated, though not enough to deem the game completely playable without knowledge of Japanese. His inspiration for taking on the project came after the completion of the fan translation for Mother 3, wanting to work on another Nintendo-based RPG with a distinctive style. Plus, his online handle is Tomato, which just seems extremely fitting. After starting work on the translation, Tomato came to realize the project would be as intensive as that of Mother 3. In 2010, he had uploaded his tools to allow others to attempt progress on the project, though to little avail. In 2016, Clyde did a live playthrough of the game on Twitch, using a basic proof-of-concept translation so the audience could follow, receiving suggestions on new names for items, enemies, and the like. In December of 2016, he had completed the game on Twitch, updated his patch and his tools, and uploaded them to his blog, Legends of Localization. When speaking on Superstar Saga's remake with Game Informer, Yoshihiko Mayakawa, a producer at Alpha Dream, was asked why the West never saw a release of Tomato Adventure. He responded, Huh. The reason why is the age group we were targeting was a bit too low and a bit too small. We also had some trouble with the battle system, and it wasn't received well at the time of release. Throughout the various interviews conducted for the title, the team would often reiterate that the game was incredibly child-friendly, but that this wouldn't be the only audience who would enjoy it. Despite this, it's very likely that Nintendo had noticed the demographic most drawn to the game in Japan, and considered Mario to be a much more marketable venture to undertake and invest into if they intend to publish an RPG in the West.